welcome. Thanks for joining us. May the Holy Spirit work in your life as you hear this message. We landed in the middle of the night. I don't remember where we'd come from or even how long we'd traveled, how many stops we had made along the way, but when I was about 13 years old, my parents and I landed in New Delhi, India, sometime while the sun still slept. After clearing customs and grabbing our luggage, we piled into a taxi, eager to get to our hotel. Now, the cab driver had a buddy with him, and with me and my mom and my dad, we all climbed into the car and drove off. I can't tell you where we stopped, but I can tell you it was nowhere near the hotel. Some empty road in the middle of the night, not a soul in sight. Now, in case you don't know my heritage, my mom is from the Philippines and my dad was from India, so every other summer we traveled to both countries with stops in Europe and in Asia, and it was a really fun way to grow up most of the time. So back in the cab, I don't understand Hindi, but I could tell you that the conversation between my dad and the drivers did not go well. The cabbies demanded some exorbitant sum in return for driving us the rest of the way. And if my dad didn't pay, they threatened to leave us and our luggage there on that road, all by ourselves. Now this is decades before the advent of cell phones and even phone booths in that part of the country. But my dad, ever the man of principle, demanded that the cabbies return us to the airport. The cabbies refused, repeating that they would simply strand us there. Now my mom and I were exhausted and even then, I knew enough about exchange rates to understand that the cabbie's demand would not hurt us too much in terms of dollars. But my dad went back and forth with these two extortionists until he relented. Thankfully, we all made it to our hotel safely. Now, by the way, cabbies ripping off tourists also happens in the United States. I once read about a taxi driver in New York, and, and this story is actually infamous. Uh, this was years ago, and the cabbie took a pair of Japanese tourists on a $200 cab ride from LaGuardia Airport to Midtown Manhattan. In those years, it should have cost maybe about $30, $35 with a tip. $200. Not even Uber charges that much on, in bad weather. And I'm sure that we can all come up with stories about disturbing, disturbing things that happen while we're on a journey. We think we're going somewhere, we anticipate the joy about reaching our destination, and then something terrible happens. And the hurt remains with us for the rest of our lives. So imagine coming to church and hearing all about God's grace and mercy and provision and forgiveness and love and eternal life in Jesus Christ, all that really great stuff, only to hear that some of us cannot take a full part in it. Oh, we can come to worship, and we can certainly give our money. But as far as the church is concerned, at best, despite our love for God, despite our faith in Christ, despite our zealousness for ministry, we are considered second-class citizens in God's kingdom, if citizens at all. From 1939 to 1968, the Methodist Episcopal Church segregated predominantly black Methodist churches into their own jurisdiction against the will of their own members. It was called the Central Jurisdiction, and it was an organizational betrayal of the unity black and white Methodists enjoyed more than a century prior. And I hope that we understand that in many ways, even today, 
we still treat some of our brothers and sisters in Christ as second-class citizens. Perhaps in ways we're not even aware. Snide comments to newcomers like, you're sitting in my seat. Or not talking to newcomers at all. Arguing over storage spaces. Arguing over the form of worship or the color of the carpeting. Thoughtless, political, religious, or gender-related comments made without regard to the listener's feelings or personal history. It happens all the time. Much of the time, we might not even mean it. We might not mean it. And, and sometimes we just say things without even realizing the impact of our words. But make no mistake, when unkind things happen in church, where the kingdom of heaven is supposed to become reality, when unkind things happen, especially to people who have already experienced harm outside the church, well, it can feel a lot like being stranded alone in the middle of a dark and unknown road, held up by people we're supposed to trust. And it might lead some of us to ask, is this all just a sham, a charade? Sometimes it seems more accurate to say in church, Love the neighbors you like. Love the neighbors who are just like you. And forget everyone else. They're not saved anyway. How far? How very far from the vision of church offered to us by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Ephesians. As we will read in just a moment, Paul urges us to speak peace to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Speak of Christ's peace everywhere, to everyone. Now, before we get into our scripture today, I'd, I'd like to lift up a Wednesday evening class beginning on October 12th. Our own Reverend Ann Davis will lead us through a book by Dave Burkett entitled Bring Them Back Alive. And this book specifically addresses the challenge of reaching out to and inviting and welcoming people who have left the church, especially those who have suffered harm in church. So this class begins on Wednesday, October 12th, that's two Wednesdays from now, at 6.30 p.m. in our fellowship hall. And it should run, I think, about four weeks or so. So you can look for more information. It didn't make it into the bulletin, so you might not find it there. But you can look for it in our weekly email and in next week's bulletin and on our website, etc., etc. If you have any questions, please contact myself, um, and I'll try to put you in touch with Reverend Ann if you have specific questions for her. Bring them back alive. Okay, so last time we finished reading through the Acts of the Apostles a fascinating collection of the stories of the early church. And so I thought for the month of October we might read a letter from Paul to one or more of the churches that he founded. So today let's open our Bibles or our Bible apps and turn to Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 13. That's where we'll begin. Now Ephesians, just to get into it, is six chapters long. You could read the whole thing in probably about an hour. And scholars suggest that Paul writes this letter from where we left him off in Acts, as a prisoner in Rome, awaiting an uncertain fate. Now, in Paul's day, the city of Ephesus, located on the Turkish coast of the Aegean Sea, has a rich and diverse religious history. People worship a number of different Greek and Roman deities, including the Roman emperor. And at this point, Followers of Christ represent a religious minority within a minority. And not only this, but followers of Christ in Ephesus come from vastly different backgrounds. Jewish and Gentile, and Gentile being a catch-all word for people who used to worship all these different deities in and around the Mediterranean. 
Different forms of worship, different beliefs, different cuisines, different customs, different cultures, all of it. How does Paul manage to bring them all together? Let's read the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verses 13 through 20. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints, and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. The word of God for the people of God and the people of God say, thanks be to God. Be to God. Okay. So now when, when Paul writes here, you who were far off, to phrase it with bad English grammar, who is you? Who is you? Well, of course, yes, he's addressing the believers in Ephesus, especially those who had previously worshipped the Greek goddess Ar Artemis or the Roman emperor or one of the many other deities one might find in a first century port city in the Mediterranean in the Aegean Sea. But, but thinking across space and time, that is thousands of years and thousands of miles, thinking across language and culture and thinking across history, it seems to me that Paul also writes to each and every one of us. If not for Paul, if not for the church that planted and still plants the seeds of faith in Jesus Christ all over this planet, and if not for our founder, John Wesley, who saw all the world as his parish, well, chances are you and I wouldn't be here today. We would not be here together. In this section of his letter to the Ephesians, Paul unites people of vastly different backgrounds and ways of life, Jew and Gentile, and draws them together into one new humanity. Jesus is our peace, not our impetus for denunciation and dissension and division. Jesus reconciles us through his sacrifice upon the cross, creating the possibility of peace and love and forgiveness and mercy and eternal life, not just when we someday enter the realm of heaven, but right here on earth, right now among people from all walks of life, all ages, nations, and races. How awesome is that? Now, I don't talk much about the current debates and disagreements taking place within the United Methodist Church. But on this World Communion Sunday, in which we celebrate the, the planetary quality of our church, it might seem like an opportune time to do so. Now, to sum up a long and painful process, perhaps you've seen news reports that a number of churches across our denomination and reportedly some 100 churches in our Florida Annual Conference are moving to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church. And this is largely over a long-standing disagreement on whether or not gay people should be married in the church or ordained as clergy. The discipline in our United Methodist Church, that is our rule book, currently does not allow for either. 
Now, we can go back and forth of, of our various perspectives about this, what Scripture says, how we should apply it, etc., etc., our life experience, our families, our friends, our church members, how our current polity might affect the future of our church, especially pertaining to younger generations. We can start to raise questions as to who is a first-class citizen in, the, citizen in the kingdom of heaven or not. But the reality is that our rule book, the discipline, unless it changes, all of this stuff that is going on outside Trinity United Methodist Church doesn't really affect the way we do ministry here today. Or at least it shouldn't. We still celebrate the bread and cup with an open table. All who wish to partake, to share in the bread and cup, all who earnestly repent of their sin and who profess Jesus Christ as their Savior, all who long to practice some form of ministry alongside us as the Holy Spirit leads, all are invited and welcome. And unless these rules change, in my mind, we just keep doing what we're doing right here, right now. None of us, regardless of what happens in the future, will ever have 100% of what we think church ought to be. But we will have one another. And we will always remain joined together as one body and one people in our Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord. So I'll say it plainly. I don't like this idea of disaffiliation. The United Methodist Church welcomed me, a guy like me, a newcomer like me, at the age of 37. I was baptized at the age of 37. I was called to ministry at the age of 38, and the United Methodist Church supported me in my endeavor. A United Methodist Seminary provided me with a theological education, and the Florida Annual Conference welcomed a newcomer like me with all my ideas, let's put it that way, amazing opportunities to serve. And honestly, despite all of the hot talk and the diatribes and all of the nastiness I read on Facebook, especially among United Methodist clergy, it's really strange. That group is just a funny bunch. The Florida Annual Conference, the United Methodist Church still feels very much like home like a family. We don't always get along together, but we're still family. And so, for as long as I am appointed to the United Methodist Church, the Trinity United Methodist Church here on Savannah Road right near the post office, okay, I will advocate that we remain in the United Methodist Church. I will put all of my 210 pounds that back this thumb on that side of the scale. And yes, I have gained 10 pounds over the last year. <laughs> and here's a little bit about why. In his epistle to the Ephesians, Paul blends two widely disparate groups into one people made new by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ our Lord. In Methodist history, long before the establishment of this central jurisdiction, Blacks and whites, slaves and free, met at camp meetings in the wilderness to pray and worship God in Jesus Christ together. John Wesley licensed women to preach among the Methodists over 200 years ago now. And here at Trinity United Methodist Church, if we just take a look at each other, go ahead, Go ahead, take a look at each other. Just turn your head, take your head, look at your neighbors, okay? We come from a variety of walks of life, different backgrounds, different parts of the country, different parts of the world, and we are all joined together by our common faith in Jesus Christ. As Paul writes in the letter we just heard, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God. 
built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. This time as we celebrate the bread and cup, let's remember that we share with people from all over the world. We share in the bread and cup with people that we have never met, and we share in the bread and cup to people we have yet to meet, and even people we will never meet. We share in the bread and cup within our good old beloved United Methodist Church. So wherever we go, let us preach Christ's peace. Let's preach peace everywhere and to everyone. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. And God, on this day, we remember that we share in the sacrifice of your Son with people all over the world, people we know, people we have yet to know, people we will never know. And God, on this day, we also remember that we share in the bread and cup with people who have suffered loss, people in Fort Myers, Florida, people up and down the East Coast, all of those who were affected by the storm. God, we share in the bread and cup with people who mourn, with people who are ill, with people who are dying, with people who are losing or have lost the ones we love. We share in the bread and the cup with them all. And we pray, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit will give us compassion and kindness, that we may offer comfort to those we know who are in times of trouble. And God, you sent your Son into this world who showed us how to heal, to welcome the outcasts, to invite the sinners to table, to repentance, and to eternal life, who raised us from the dead. And God, in his sacrifice, he gave his life that we might be forgiven of our sin. And you raised him up out of the tomb as a sign of your eternal, steadfast love, forgiveness, and eternal life. And for this ultimate gift, we thank you and we offer you the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share our video. Let's send God's love all over the world. If you find yourself in Jensen Beach, Florida, please join us for worship. Our services are at 9, 15, and 11. And if you'd like to find out more, please visit www.trinityjb.org. See you next time. Blessings.